Tonight on Backyard Farmer, we'll check out some beautiful western trees and show you how you can design your landscape to conserve water. That's all coming up next, right here on Backyard Farmer. Again, and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We've got another great show for you tonight, of course, answering your gardening questions. You can get in touch with us by dialing 1 800 676 5446. Our phone volunteers will be happy to help you. Pictures and emails for a future show can be sent to byf at unl.edu. We do need to know where you live. Give us as much information as you can so we can give you a good answer. So with that out of the way, let's start with samples. Jody, you have both live and dead somethings. Yeah, I never know if they're gonna behave when I bring them live. So I brought Colorado potato beetles and I've got the larval form and the adult form. And I'll let those ones crawl around a little bit. <laughs> um, we are seeing these in the garden this year, which we haven't seen before. They are a pest of potatoes, but also other uh, plants in the Solanaceae family. So tomatoes, we've got these ones from eggplant, and they're also on the weeds. So if you've got some black nightshade or ground cherries, that could also be host for these larvae. Um, the bad thing is, is that they are resistant to many insecticides, but the good thing is, is if you've got the plants in the vegetative state, there can be like 25% um, defoliation, but the main part where you want to treat, if possible, is going to be when they're flowering or when the tubers are expanding. So since it's after that stage in most parts of where we are, it's not too bad. So you may see them, you can pick them off. I would wear gloves because they're kind of gooey and um, yeah, pick those off, dump them in soapy water and try to get as much off so they overwinter as adults. Uh, many generations per growing season. Oh, so, boy. yeah, something to look for and pick off. Oh, we need one more pest. Okay, Rock, you have pieces of paper. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's that time of year where we're going to be doing um, reseeding of lawns, and also you're going to be planting other things all the time. And one of the things is that they all have, by federal law, if it's transported across state lines, they have to have a label, and the most rudimentary label is white, and on the white label, they will have a lot of information that's of value. This happens to be the best grass seed because that's marketing. But uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, and you'll notice there's a couple of things here. There's four varieties in here. Two of them are VNS, which stands for variety not stated. That's an immediate flag. You don't want something where variety is not stated because you don't know what you're getting. You'll, then you'll notice that there's a few that look like common tall fescue varieties in this, in this case, and they're germinating at 90% and their seed source is organ. Okay, you go down the list a little bit more and then you start noticing the inert ingredients jump up to like 50%. And when you jump up to 50%, you gotta wonder what's going on. Well, generally that's fertilizer or additives or whatever. So this probably has a fertilizer on it, but you know, not all of them have all of these things and some of them don't. You also wanna be very conscious of the weed seeds. In this case, you got a 1%, which doesn't seem like much. But what you really wanna see is the blue tag. And we talk about blue tag certified seed all the time. This has been tested by the crop protection clinic or crop, crop protection um, group, whatever, I forgot their name, um, in Nebraska. So you know Nebraskans looked at this, they <coughs> certified it as to genetic origin and purity. And so you know when you're buying seed in a store that's got a blue tag on it, that it's had one additional testing to make sure you're getting what you bought, what you paid for. Now, by law, they only have to have a white tag on them. And we're not saying don't buy white tag seed, but the best bet is to buy blue tag certified seed. And if you go into the garden store and the seed tag is torn off or is just hanging there, it's no longer certified because who knows what they dumped into the bag when they opened it up to distribute it. So just be conscious of uh, the seed label and uh, make sure you get blue tag certified if at all possible. Thank you, Rock. All right, Lauren, giant leaves. Yeah, I got some big leaves here. Uh, all of our uh, gardeners, many of you manage rust diseases, and tonight I brought along uh, some sunflower leaves. And sunflower rust is something that, that some of you may have not seen before, but you would see the just general yellowing in, on the upper side. And then if we turn it over, um, you would see the, whoops, got mixed up there. You'll see the uh, little dusty pustules. Get right in here. 
And the unique thing about sunflower rust, and why I brought it tonight, is that this is a rust disease that completes its entire life cycle on the sunflower plant. So if we look up here, we can see these little black areas. Let's see if I can get this right. Now, these are actually the overwintering spores that form as the sunflower plant matures and we get later in the season. These are called teliospores, and those will actually overwinter, and this disease overwinters on the residue of the plant. So a little different than our, our rust like we see with cedar apple rust that goes from cedar to apple and cycles, and many of you are familiar with that. Uh, this is one that continues on the plant uh, and then goes to the next cycle through growing through the soybean plant, or I said soybean sunflower plant, I'm sorry, uh, to cycle through and then you have that repeating stage just like we do on our other rust where it'll keep infecting. So nothing I'd really recommend for the backyard gardening uh, scenario, but just a, a, a nice example of a different type of a rust that we see in the landscape. All right, thank you, Lauren. And some tomatoes that don't quite look ready yet, mm -hmm. Sarah. Yeah, so our vegetable gardens are in full swing right now. And one of the problems that we run into in the vegetable garden uh, at this time of year is if we get a big rainstorm, you could go out the next day and find out that your tomatoes have split. Because as the skins get mature, they become less elastic. And if we have a big influx of rain and the plants take up a lot of water, oftentimes the skin can't accommodate that. And so the skin just splits open. So one trick that you can use to, to uh, <coughs> eliminate that problem in your garden is looking at um, the ripeness of the tomatoes. So um, one thing you might not know is that when a tomato starts to develop even the first hints of color, it has <coughs> already developed all of the sugars and other flavor compounds that it needs to have a good flavor in that tomato. So um, let's say we've got a big rain forecast uh, overnight. Um, you could go out into your garden and you could look for tomatoes that are like this, which are not really at a totally at an eating stage yet, but these could be harvested and brought inside and you could finish ripening them indoors and you could avoid all of that problems with split or cracked tomatoes, okay? So the other two tomatoes I have here to show you, this, this larger one is still fully green. It's not even anywhere close to having any uh, pink colorations to it at all. Um, uh, and the one in the middle, you can see the, the skin color is changing from that dark apple green to more of a whitish green, but this one still is not ready. It doesn't have the flavor compounds developed in it yet. If you wanted to do some fried green tomatoes, you could, you could harvest these, but if you're looking for a good uh, fresh tomato with good flavor, you could harvest this one and finish the ripening indoors. All right, excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Now I'm hungry for fried green tomatoes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, Jody, first round of picture questions comes to you. Uh, the first one comes to us from Omaha, two pictures. She's wondering, what is this growth on our wild grapes and can they prevent it? So these are galls from grape phylloxera and phylloxera is related to aphids and there's not really anything you can do with this since it's a wild grape. I wouldn't recommend trading, spending the money or time to do that. If you were growing grapes for any other reason, um, there would be resistant varieties to phylloxera. All right, uh, one picture on the next one. This comes to us from Honey Creek, Iowa, and this is a Concord grape with some leaf damage. Uh, he says he can't find any bugs of, or worms of any sort. Yeah, I can't really tell from this one picture what the rest of the, the grape leaves look like. It could be from old feeding damage, from grape, like flea beetles, like the larvae, but it doesn't look like, like any caterpillar damage because it would be more skeletonized and defoliated. So uh, probably, you know, if, if it's happening throughout the, the rest of the grapes, I would maybe send another sample or- Right, or, a bigger picture, yeah. or more of it. All right, and you have one more. Uh, this is a what is this critter, and uh, he lives by Blair. Yeah, this is a giant ichneumonid wasp, and so we see those, the striped ones, this is the, the black species of it, and they are parasitoids of wood-boring insect larvae. So a... I would consider this a good guy. Good guy. <laughs> It's a good girl, actually. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Jody. <laughs> okay, Rock, uh, your first picture comes to us from uh, Fremont. He's asking, is this a wild lettuce? And then, of course, usually the follow-up is what to do about it. 
Yeah, so this is wild lettuce, but it's already, it's a biennial. So, you know, last year it was down close to the soil. Now it's starting, you know, it's starting to pop up. And it, they actually can be relatively easily hand pulled. There's not any really herbicide recommendations. And I see that it looks like it's among other broadleaf plants. So try to hand pull that. If you let it go to seed, you're going to have to use pre-emergence next spring. Um, which might be a problem in that particular area. And they produce a ridiculous amount, you know, five to 7,000 seeds for a single plant. So clearly you need to uh, get on it. And there are some broadleaf herbicides that work, but in and amongst those other plants that I think are desirable, I would just pull it. All right, uh, one picture on the next one also. This comes to us from Pierce. Uh, what is the best product to control spurge in the lawn? Well, right now, nothing. Um, it's too late. <laughs> Um, you can you can put down a broadleaf herbicide earlier, uh, but right now it's starting to set seed. And if you do that right when it's setting seed, and it's um, it tends to produce more seeds. So then you just you know you get rid of the problem this year, but you don't get rid of it for next year. So I'm going to say they can spray it back for revenge, um, <laughs> but it's really kind of a waste of a herbicide. And and then next spring, make sure you get a pre-emergence down. But the trouble with the spurge is it germinates really late. So don't be putting those applications down in April. Put those April applications down in Fremont, right? So in Fremont, about the first week in May, and then your second application should go down in the lawn that will control the spurge. All right, thanks, Rock. Lauren, uh, two pictures on the first one here. This comes to us from Omaha. He says, uh, this is a question for next year. His peonies had some strange flower blooms toward the end of their bloom cycle. Did they get some kind of a peony attack? He did say he thought he had thrips last year, but he didn't see any this year. Yeah, and I, I looked at this, uh, Kim, and I, I, I'm really questioning, but try to splight is what we think about when we see peonies that brown like this, but I couldn't really see any lesions on the leaves or, or anything else with that. Um, but, but that would be uh, one thing, and I don't know, Sarah, do you have a comment on this one that wouldn't be Botrytis maybe? I do. So actually, it was interesting in the gardens this year, Lauren, because we got some um, really high temperatures that happened right at the end of the peony bloom cycle, because mm -hmm. I know my peonies, I only got to enjoy them for a few days, and then we got some high temperatures and winds, it just blasted the flowers. Mm -hmm. So I think it could very well be environmental. Environmental high temperatures. Yeah. That would make sense too, with it not looking like... Yep. Perfect. There's nothing there for And nothing he can do about right. high temperatures nothing to do about year. it. <laughs> All right. I'm being better next year. <laughs> you have two pictures on the next one. This is also peonies. Uh, this is on an acreage, Fort Calhoun, and he doesn't want these to die because he thinks they came over on the Mayflower with the ancestors. <laughs> well, a couple of things. Uh, well, there are two things where they're older, too. This one in particular, if we look close, it's, it has some symptoms of a mosaic virus. Uh, on the leaves uh, lower with those yellow blotches, which is not a disease that, that we see consistently spread in peonies, but is one to watch out for. Um, I'd be careful doing any cutting between those because your potential to move that would be a problem. Um, the other ones, and you can see on this too, you can see some leaf spotting, and there is a cerco cercospora leaf spot, which would be more of a residue-borne disease, similar to botrytis. Uh, so management on that, you know, trying to avoid overhead irrigation, mulching good. Uh, but just be careful with the one with the mosaic symptoms. Uh, if you're really concerned about that and potential movement, you might want to rogue that one out. All right. Uh, one more picture, and this is an aster. Seems to be dying. It's always been very hardy. This comes to us from Norfolk, and dying, of course, from the bottom up. Well, and a, and a couple things on this. It, it looks drier. Um, I mean, they are sensitive to the high temperature and drier conditions, and they'll do this. Uh, looking up on the leaves, there are some foliar diseases, and over time, those can build up. So septoria leaf spot on asters is pretty common. Um, but the way it's so dry, I wondered if maybe there might be mites or something on that as well. So I, I would give that one a careful inspection. Um, bottom up can be a root rot, um, but it, the way it's thinning out overall, I think there could be something else going on. So just give that a look for, for possibly some sort of, a, of an insect issue. Jody, I don't know if you want to comment, but maybe like a spider mite or something on there. Yeah, a lot of lace bugs too. Lace bugs, okay. That'd All be right. another one to look for. Sarah, one picture on this first one. This comes to us from Council Bluffs. Um, the July 12th, 80 to 90 mile per hour wind uh, took down a, a ornamental pear. He cut down the stump, made a bird bath, added a uh, fat billy hobbit head to scare the birds away. But his question, of course, is will the tree send out shoots? It may. I mean, if this was a healthy, vigorous tree before the storm, 
Um, it may very well send up some shoots from the root system. I mean, it's, on, it's only been a month, so it may not have had time to do that yet. Um, so what I, if you want to keep the stump, what I would just do is a stump treatment, basically where you cut the suckers down and you paint those cut stumps with concentrated Roundup, and eventually you'll kill the root system, and then you'll just have a stump left at, to hold up your bird feeder. All right. <laughs> Two pictures on the next one. Uh, this comes to us, let's see, I think Omaha. So he's got the, the vines growing on his house. The second one is uh, they clung to his aluminum doors and windows. He doesn't want to sand and paint. Is there anything that will take those, uh, Boston Ivy in this case, will it take those nice little frog feet off? Yeah, and I'm sorry to say that I don't have an easy solution for you here. I did a little bit of research before the show and uh, I actually was referring to this old house um, and their recommendations for removing the remains of ivy vines like this on a house and they, they didn't come up with anything other than <laughs> sanding and painting. Right. So I'm sorry, I think you're just gonna have to do the work. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Well, we took a trip out west this week. We're going to show you some very interesting features about western Nebraska horticulture. First up, we're going to hear from Amy Seiler and Chrissy Land about some great tree selections around the Scott, Scotts Bluff and Garing areas. Today, we're going to be talking about some really fun trees, unique trees that we have discovered in our travels across the West. Yes, we're pretty excited about it. It's really fun when somebody calls us and says, hey, did you know that we have one of these out here? And then we get to go and look at the trees and it's just always so much fun to look at what different unique things people have thrown in their backyards and for whatever reason, they are happy as a clam. So we have some northern pecans that we've discovered as we're kind of cruising around town. And we were amazed that we could find pecans this big growing and they're even producing some nuts. So that might be a tree that everyone might want to try to incorporate into their landscape. Another one is so unique and I've seen it a couple different places but I'm so happy to see it way out west in Geary, Nebraska is Turkish filbert. It has neat little foliage, it's got a great tight little shape, great color and it's really adaptable to our soils so that's another fun one that people should try to incorporate. Finally one that I've also discovered is the Amir cork tree and I can't believe that we can get it to grow and it's one of those trees that we utilized from the Retree Nebraska program. We put it in a schoolyard and it's seeming to do really really well probably needs a little pruning job um, before we get too much further um, before we can't um, control it as well as we would like. <laughs> yeah it's always so much fun when trees surprise us. Got to go check out this really cool bald cypress tree. Um, definitely one that wants to be in the lawn. Mm -hmm. It's in a really protected spot which makes sense why it's doing so happy and oddly enough uh, right next door we happen to come across also a American sycamore tree. Uh, again not another not a tree that you would commonly find in western Nebraska uh, the homeowners told us that they had a little bit of twig die back. Um, it is a little bit exposed to the west, which honestly we would expect that here in western Nebraska. Um, it's not really the deep freeze in the middle of winter. It's always that, you know, late freeze or early freeze in October and that late freeze that happens in, in April that causes some problems. But other than that, um, it was also brought to my attention that we have a yellow wood in Scott's Bluff and downtown in the Centennial Park. And so that is a tree that anybody can go and check mm. out. Um, I got to see it in bloom last year and there were bumblebees all over it. It was just the coolest thing. Oh, I love it. I just love that we have people that want to push the envelope, that want to do some different things. And it's always unique to see what's successful and what's not successful. And I love um, this idea of the pecans that we have because we have two, it's not just one. Right. And so we know that it wasn't just by chance. Right. This is probably a seed source that's really meant to be here. Yes. And so just trying to get that incorporated into the landscape more and finding some seed sources that we can utilize is really what we want. Yeah, absolutely. I would be really excited um, to have anybody send me an email at chrissyland at unl.edu 
um, if you've got a unique tree in your backyard that you've planted or know of one, uh, we definitely want to kind of keep tabs on these trees because like mm -hmm. you said, we want to know, is it potentially a good seed source that we should be working yes. with more often? Um, or is it for whatever reason, the only one in that area? <laughs> and that's what we love is tree enthusiasts. We want to know about the cool trees all the time. Yes, I love it. Oh, it's always fun. They've had so much rain out in the panhandle that everything really looks green, growing well. We will also hear from Chrissy later in the show on another project out there. All right, Jody, question number one for you this time around comes from Wisner. She has native thistles turning brown at the seed head. Is it drought or is it one of those seed head things? Well, it could be the thistle caterpillar. She can mm -hmm. peel those back and see if there's a caterpillar in there pupating. Mm -hmm. That would also be the painted lady. All right, excellent. Uh, second one comes to us from Lincoln. Sunflower plants with these consuming the leaves. She wondered if they were monarchs or a different species of butterfly. Does she <coughs> leave them to feed or remove them? Yes, yeah, so they're not monarchs, but they will turn out to be a checker spot butterfly. So I would put them somewhere. They will soon fall into the soil and overwinter as the third instar. So they won't be there for long, and then you can cut that leaf off anyway. All right. One more picture. This comes to us from Aurora, unfortunately. Had not seen Japanese beetles, and suddenly they attacked the peach. Uh, they picked, they wrapped the branches. Um, the, the real question, of course, is there anything they can do now? More importantly, what can they do next year? Okay, so this situation looks all too familiar with me because I used to have a peach tree. Mm -hmm. So now that you know that they're there, they will likely be back next year. So when they start emerging, you want to pick them off as soon as possible because when the Japanese beetles start feeding, that's where they will all go because the plant will signal to other beetles to come there. So remove these fruits that are highly being fed on. So get like a bucket of soapy water and just prune that peach off into, and remove them as soon as you can. All right. Thanks, Jody. Rock, you have two pictures on this first one. Uh, this is the front. He says the front lawn is good, the back lawn is not. Backyard looks every year in the middle of the summer and then it looks like the front in September when it's cooler. Any suggestions why the backyard does it and not the front? So I think your second picture shows the, yeah, the spot. Yeah, it could be exposure, could be any number of things. There's also some major mower tracking going on here. So when you mow when it's too wet or too dry, you do get some tracking. But I mean, that doesn't seem to be the, the consumer's issue. But it, we really can't see. I tried to blow this picture up and look for lesions or something that would indicate it was something other than environmental. I saw none. So there, you know, it's been a bad year for growing a lot of things. And you know, it went from no water to lots of water, you know, depending upon where you were. So without a closer picture, um, we're not gonna be able to say it's anything other than environmental stress. All right, uh, two picks on the next one. This is also brown spots, and this is a Deschler area. Hasn't done anything to this except add water. He did put baking soda on one and then watered it in earlier in the season. So he said it did begin to green up with baking soda. Um, interesting, I'm not sure what baking soda necessarily would do, but uh, you know that is one of the Facebook type recommendations, but we don't really see any value of using it. But if it worked for him, then certainly he should continue. And once again, this is another picture where we, you know, they're trying their hardest to give us a picture, but if we can't see the leaf or we can't see the crown of the plant down at the base of the ground, it's really next to impossible to be able to do anything with that, to be able to tell you a recommendation that would actually work. But the baking soda worked, so go for it. All right, and one more, this comes to us from Link uh, wondering, is this a weed or a perennial plant of, of uh, saving opportunity? No, no, get rid of this. It's pokeweed. It's an <coughs> aggressive perennial. It's been spreading all over, um, pretty much all over the, the central west, east, and even a little bit west. You see it everywhere. It's extremely poisonous. Every part of it is poisonous. The roots are the most poisonous. The berries, which are attractive to birds, which some people like from a, you know, a bird standpoint, but, you know, five... If a child ate five and they do look like they're kind of cherry and whatever, um, that child is going to have diarrhea for about 10 days and be probably dehydrated. And um, about 50 berries would kill a human. So very toxic. Get it out of there. Triclopyr will work if it's in a place where you don't have desirable um, broadleaf ornamentals. But if it isn't, um, then you've got to, well, if you brush it on, maybe. 
Glyphosate works, but not very well, and there is some resistance documented in other states for resistance. Get that out of You can dig it, but it's a perennial, and it's got a pretty massive root system. So say goodbye to pokeweed. And Rock. Lauren says, Rock. yeah, let's eat I it. I grew up eating pokeweed. <laughs> I take you to grocery stores in the South and say pokeweed on the can. Well, good for them. So how's that work? <laughs> you just got to eat the leaves, and you got to cook it right. So, no, so, don't eat the berries, though, so it's right? Kind it's of like poisonous. And maybe about. the diarrhea thing, my mom always called it spring cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Lauren? Right. Here's the deal. You, you say the only Stop. mushroom you should eat. Stop it. The only mushroom you eat should be in a can, right? <laughs> All right, boys. Let's not do that. We need to move oh, on, you okay. guys. <laughs> Just skip <Good>. it. <laughs> <laughs> Two pictures on the first one. Uh, tiny melons forming. Now the melons have disappeared. And all is, it's these weird white growths. So... We don't know what this is. This one really has me stumped. Yeah. Um, and I look different virus symptoms. I, I really, unfortunately, have no idea. If anyone else has an idea on that, please comment. But um, not sure. It'd be love, just, It'd yeah, be a great maybe. one to have a sample and, of yeah, because she does sample. live in. See if it continues. If it. Yeah. If you get a fruit set at all. Yeah. Okay. You know, I don't think the leaves look completely normal either, mm -mm. which well, makes me wonder if there's a virus that's causing excessive. That hair growth or, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, deformed leaves, which seems to be in that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then oftentimes virus infected plants don't set fruits well. So the flowers will come out and they'll just bore, they'll just abort. They won't actually set a fruit. Mm -hmm. So if so. the leaves look normal like that, then that would mm -hmm. match. Yeah. I, I really couldn't tell yeah. for sure. Maybe we can get a sample yeah. from her. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. One pick on the next one, uh, Lauren, this is in Beatrice. They were excited to see hydrangeas. They haven't bloomed, of course. They are not going to, but the leaves are yellow with reddish purple spots. So the reddish purple spots, there are leaf spots that affect hydrangea. That is, there's, we talk about cercospora a lot on a lot of different plants. Um, the yellowing, though, would be more in that nutritional growth scenario. So if someone has a comment on that one, I'd, I'd We can't. That. We are out of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> your next one is also a hydrangea. Uh, this is a little different. This one, uh, they get about four hours of sun a day. This one could be anything. Yeah, so unfortunately, I can't nasty. tell from the picture. Yeah, it could be a burn of any kind from the edge like that. So. And one more, and this comes to us from uh, Omaha, super hot ghost peppers in containers. He wonders... A few weeks ago, is this herbicide damage? Probably. In this case, I feel like it's herbicide damage just because there's new growth that looks good on the plant. All right, yep. so Sarah, your turn. This is a viewer who has, uh, from Trainer, Iowa, burning bush, looked perfect until about a month ago, and then um, the, the bottom, only this doesn't look like the burning this bush. This is the tomato This picture. looks like the tomato picture. So this is the tomato picture, which is one that is, uh, the question on this one is, this is a volunteer tomato. Will the tomatoes actually be edible? Will it turn into tomatoes? Sure. And, and it is, it does look like a tomato plant. There are some of the fruits in the, in the background in this picture, which look, do look like true tomatoes. So sure. I mean, who knows what color they'll be or what shape they'll end up being, but sure, they're going to be edible. All right. Okay, so our next picture on this one is a honeysuckle vine. And the question on this one is a pruning question. So on this one, they're, they're wondering how do we prune it or when do we prune it for better flowering? Um, typically I would prune honeysuckle in the winter I, just because you can see the vines better at that time and you can do a little bit better job uh, at strategically pruning it. And so I would just kind of prune it to shape, remove anything that's dead, maybe thin it out a little bit, and, and, that, and just go at it that way. Okay, so we're backing ourselves up a little bit. So I think we're in kind of the wrong set of pictures here. So the, the previous picture is also honeysuckle. And her question on the previous picture is, is that one that it's a variegated one, should she be cutting all the rest of those off? If you're getting vines on that variegated um, uh, honeysuckle, which are totally green, just all green with no variegation, then yes, you probably should cut those off because variegated plants, which, which revert to green in the leaves, the green is way more vigorous and it can overtake the uh, variegated portion. And in a few years, you could lose the variegated portion. So trim those green branches out. All right. Thanks, Sarah. 
Well, you know, there's never been a better time to visit our garden. Beautiful colors everywhere. Terry is going to tell you about something you can do to help fight hunger in Lincoln. So here's what's happening out in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we're continually harvesting our produce. Lots of tomatoes getting ready and peppers and eggplants. We're really seeing a great harvest from our vegetables this year. We're also enjoying all of the color. All of the flowers are looking beautiful. Our fall flowers are just really starting to be ready to pop open. So being able to get to the garden here soon to be able to see those fall flowers in full glory will be great. One other thing I want to tell you is that we are opening our shed door on Tuesday nights from 4.30 to 7 to accept all of your extra produce. So Master Gardeners will be here to accept your produce. So if you have any extra zucchini or eggplant or whatever you have extra in your garden and you'd like to donate to the UNL Food Bank, stop by on Tuesday night from 4.30 to 7, drop it off, enjoy a walk through the garden, and then maybe visit the dairy store for some ice cream. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. It is time for the lightning round. All right, Sarah, mm -hmm. your very first one comes to us from Hastings. They want to know whether they can start a clematis from a cutting, and if so, can they do it now? That's a tough question because there are so many different types of clematis. You'd have to, you'd have to do it in a specific way for each species. So um, I would say no, that's not going to be easy to do. All right. Um, we have a viewer who wonders whether the oriental poppy leaves are supposed to be dying back right now. And the same question about bleeding heart. Bleeding heart for sure. I mean, they're coming to the end of their life. So if they're turning brown, go ahead and cut it back. It's a little early for oriental poppy, but if the plants are in a dry location, it could, that could be why. Um, but it, still, we've gone far enough into the season that the bulbs should be good for next year. All right. Uh, we have a viewer from Lincoln who wonders whether Highlander boxwood is a good choice as a screen. I have to admit, I'm not familiar with Highlander boxwood. I would say probably no. I mean, we have so much trouble with winter desiccation on boxwood. I'd be, I'd be skeptical. All right. And is it time to transplant peonies now? It's a little early. I would wait till early September. All right. Nice job. And I don't know Highlander either, so I'll okay. have to look that one up. Yeah. <laughs> that one just came in. All right. Lauren, your first one comes to us uh, from Deschler. Peonies get powdery mildew every summer. It's a shady site. Should he cut them back and compost them or just let it be? Um, I would use as much sanitation as possible in that situation. Uh, and actually some overhead watering can help on powdery mildew. All right, we have a Grand Island viewer who thinks they have a jelly ear fungus on a black walnut and they're wondering, is that a beneficial fungus? Uh, usually anything that is fruiting like that is the result of something being broken down. So if it's on a living tree, um, it's not going to be a good sign if it's on a dead tree. It's just breaking things down. All right. Uh, we have a viewer in Gavin's Point, and the uh, plants have aster yellows. She wants to know whether they will be normal next year. Will they still look like that next year? They'll still look like that. If you don't like it, I would rogue it out. All right. And her next question is, can she plant new plants of the same type in the same space next year? without uh, any damage. As, as long as you have all the material out, just keep in mind the roots and things like that. If you have any sprouts in there, they're gonna be systemically infected. So just be careful with that. All right, nice job. Okay, you ready, Rock? Sure. Your first one comes to us from Brainerd. Uh, is there a preen that would be effective for bindweed? And if so, when to put it down? No, because there's no activity of preen on um, field bindweed. All right, same person wonders, is there anything they can do this fall to uh, help eliminate the issue next spring with bindweed? No, they're just gonna have to get on it as soon as they see it because once it gets a little bit viney and creeps behind other plant material, you can't see it and you can't get it sprayed. All right, uh, a question from somebody about which turf did you recommend for shade in your segment? Uh, that's uh, the, the true fine fescues, creeping red fescue, sheep fescue, or hard fescue. And you can usually see it in seed shade mixes. Um, and we're really pleased with the way we think that's going to perform, especially in the um, courtyard. 
All right. So we have a Holdridge viewer who wants to know how to rid buffalo, a buffalo grass lawn of yellow and green foxtail. So pre-emergent in the spring. All right. Matt said spray remedy on white poplar shoots. And the question is, will it kill the grass and the underground roots? Yeah, you got to be careful with remedy. I mean, there's going to be some overspray, or especially when you're spot spraying for rate. So be careful with remedy in and around plants you want. All right. Nice job. Okay. Jody, ready? Yep. This is actually from two different viewers this week. Uh, the Alanthus, which is, of course, that mm -hmm. interesting tree of, tree of heaven, is that webworm moth a friend or a foe? It's a friend. It doesn't do anything but look cool. All right. <laughs> we have a viewer who has a lot of rows of Sharon in flower right now, and she's wondering about uh, whether she needs to provide supplemental water for the bees. I don't think so. Okay. I would say no. All that's right. going to be right or wrong answer. Okay. We have a Blair viewer who wonders uh, whether ants would be eating the aphids or the other small black bugs that are on her milkweed. So the ants are actually, I guess, farming the aphids. So they don't eat the aphids. They take care of it and eat the honeydew. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who wonders whether cicadas are emerging now because there are holes in the ground. Yes, they are emerging now. They're screaming. <laughs> All right. Uh, and we have a Lincoln viewer who has round holes about a quarter of an inch in diameter in an ash tree. Is that emerald ash borer and should they be controlled? I don't think it's emerald ash borer. That hole sounds too large. Mm -hmm. And not a D. Yeah, not a D. Nice job. All right. Sarah, plants of the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two beautiful plants. So this tall one or this, this uh, smaller pink one here in the front, this is um, surprise lily or magic lily or naked lady. It goes by lots of different uh, names. It grows, you get long strappy leaves that develop in the spring, but then they die back by the early part of summer. And then surprise, you get the flowers that come on later with no foliage at all. And you just have these tall stalks. They're a great easy bulb to grow. Um, and I love the, the pop of color that they bring to a, a garden at this time of year. Um, the little white flowers here, this is a type of panicled hydrangea called silver dollar, which gets to be about five feet wide, five feet tall. So one, a nice kind of medium sized hydrangea. The panicled hydrangeas are the ones you wanna go with in Nebraska gardens. They do much, much better than the big leaf hydrangeas, the hydrangea macrophylla like endless summer and all of those. So go for the panicled hydrangeas. All right, thank you, Sarah. Jody, two pictures on the first one. Uh, this is marble-sized hard galls on the bur oak trees. Uh, he's wondering, will they kill the trees? I think two nice pictures here. Yeah, they shouldn't kill the tree. It's usually aesthetic. They're oak bullet gall. All right. Uh, two pictures on the next one, and that's the oak bullet galls up close. So our next two pictures here come to us from Papillion. They're wondering, is this a beneficial insect? There are quite a few. They run around the landscape. This is the third year. Yeah, they're, they're going to come back. So we call these cow killers. They're actually, um, it's a wingless female wasp. The males actually have wings. They are um, natural enemies of other ground nesting wasps. So if you've got like well-drained soil, cicada killers, cricket hunters, then they are actually going after them. So I guess they're kind of beneficial. They're just part of the food web, I guess. All right. Two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Norfolk. Uh, this is on his Cotoneaster. He noticed it last year. What is this and what does he do? Yeah, this is uh, the, it's called the leaf crumpler moth. And it, it looks worse than probably the damage is under there. So you can prune those out. And if you do want to treat next year, then it's got to be when the caterpillars are really little. All right, uh, Rock, two picks on the first one. This comes to us from Seward. Uh, oh, we forgot about this one. This is, uh, this is a really interesting I one in the tree. I don't think it's bug related. No, we think this is a mop or something. A very fancy bird. <laughs> All right, a bird's nest. <laughs> All right, Rock, <laughs> your next two pictures here. This is a Seward viewer. Uh, he missed the window to control nut sedge, so he's really wondering what, what he can do now, if anything. Well, actually, some of those are new sprouts, and so, you know, that one's heading. And in that bed, I would go ahead and hit, hit it with sedge hammer or sedge ender. The active ingredient is heliosulfuron, and I would spot treat. All right. Two picks on the next one. This is the Council Bluffs viewer. 
What is this grass growing sporadically in its tall fescue? How do we eliminate it? It's Canada bluegrass or poa compressa. You can tell that by its flattened stem and good luck with that. It's gonna to have to be spot sprayed with Roundup. All right, two picks on the next one. This is Lincoln. How can they kill this volunteer fountain grass in the lawn without killing the lawn? So that's actually relatively easy to control. It's a perennial and it's a perennial ornamental and it's a nasty invader of lawns. Hit it with uh, drive or clincorac in the fall. Uh, probably two applications and you should be able to knock it out of the lawn. All right, and one more. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer who said, why has her grass turned white? Doesn't look like mold. They did use a grass feed thinking it was grass seed. Yeah, I, this one started to look like tenacity or, or, or um, mesotrione, but the broadleaf <coughs> leaves aren't accepted, uh, affected at all. So I'm gonna say it's an abiotic stress and uh, it's probably not gonna grow out of it. And that actually doesn't look like one of our desirable turf grasses in that picture, so I let it go. All right. Lauren, your first one is a single <coughs> picture. Uh, how did this happen? This is, and this is tomato central, so you got five or six yeah, here. This how is, did this, this happen? Sun scald, I believe, just from the fruit being exposed to the full sun, maybe from a leaf move or where it's at. Uh, water on it would also make it more intense. All right, and your second one is from Bennington. The better boys are ending up looking like this. What's Blossom and rot on this one. Uh, yep. Calcium deficiency, you can read all about it, but the biggest thing is to keep your water more uniform moisture for availability of the nutrients. All right, and then we have one from Unadilla that has yellow <coughs> nodules. You cut them open and they're full of these. Are they safe to eat? Yeah, it should be safe to eat. Uh, this, it may not taste as well. Uh, there's a couple things that this could be stink bug. Uh, if it has little white or yellow pustules under the skin. If it's throughout the fruit, it could be a virus. I'd look at the foliage and see if anything's just started in the growth on the plant. All right, and another one, help. What is doing scald this? Again. This is scald, scald again. from Hastings. Yeah. All right, Let's and see. two more. It's Tomato Central. <clears throat> This is Tecumseh, they're looking wonderful, put on fruit, then all of a sudden this started happening. She used Immunox on this, but it didn't stop it. Yeah, and looking at this and where they used a, a fungicide as well, uh, I didn't really see leaf spots on the leaves per se here. Uh, there's a few things, sometimes there's conditions that, that plants can start dropping leaves when they have excessive fruit, which if you look at those pictures, there was a lot of fruit. Uh, that may be one option um, and you know, just trying to maintain good moisture. It looked like they were doing everything right in that though. They had, uh, you know, they had soaker hose, they had straw down, so that, right. that's a hard one. And one more, and this one is uh, Hastings. <coughs> Again, what's wrong with these? Cupped and curled leaves, it looked like on this could be a virus. The other thing, and this could relate to the other scenario with tomatoes, there are determinate varieties, right? So on this, mm -hmm. the one tomato plant, they said it didn't fruit a lot after its main fruit set. Um, that could be a determinate variety because that's what they'll do. Right, exactly. All right, thanks, Lauren. Sarah, you have two <coughs> pictures on the first one. This is the burning bush, not the tomato. And uh, this is Trainer, Iowa. Looked perfect, dry leaves, and now there's a lot more areas. Is it lack of rainfall, and will it come back? This is drought damage from last year and from early this year. We saw a lot of this similar damage in the severe drought of 2012. Those branches are probably dead, so you're going to have to come, cut them back and just let whatever is still alive try to refill in if it looks okay to you. All right, Sarah, uh, two picks on the next one. This is a uh, North Lincoln viewer concerned about this tree. It is dropping a lot of needles and a lot of sap. He is questioning, is this the drought or is something else going on? And I gave it to you because it's a tree and Lauren doesn't like trees. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is a watering issue of some kind. You look at the first picture and the grass is very green. And so either they're overwatering or they're underwatering, or they could be doing both at the same time where they're watering very shallowly, but the tree doesn't have enough water overall to live and be healthy. So I think we need a lot more discussion about the management of this tree. All right, uh, one picture on the next one, and this is, uh, when is it a good time to trim this maple? The branches are growing up the stairs and it's hard to cut the grass. Ideally, you trim it in March, just before it starts to grow. All right, and one more for you, this is Plattsmouth. Planted a maple about eight to nine years ago, doing well, and then all of a sudden this is happening. So I think the questioner said that the trunk was opening up. It's not opening up. You have bark that's dying in those sections or actually died several years ago, and the tree is now putting out new growth to try to cover it up. I think this is a planting issue because if we have root problems, it often translates into bark death on the trunk. So this tree is planted too deeply. You can see that because the sides go straight down. 
Um, so it's a planting issue. Let the tree heal. Make sure it stays well watered and maybe it'll recover. <laughs> <laughs> a big maybe on yeah. that one. There was a little hesitation on that one. <laughs> well, you know, we've had some drought conditions here in the state, followed by some really great rainfall in some areas. Chrissy Land from the Nebraska Forest Service is going to show us some designs that will thrive in most weather conditions from season to season. Here on the south side of the Evergreen House in Gearing, the garden has recently been renovated to showcase three different garden design styles that focus on water-wise landscape practices. I'm standing next to the first design style that we refer to as chaos, where we have seeded in a variety of different native pollinator-friendly plants, and we intend on not irrigating this area and letting it become a little bit more of a wild garden. As you can see, the garden looks a little weedy and wild, but that's okay. We want to be able to showcase that you don't have to have something that's highly manicured, but something that is actually low maintenance and very beneficial to our pollinators and our birds. The second part of the garden that we have here is what we refer to as the control. We have all of these different raised beds that either have one or two different species of plants in it, trying to keep it very simple, very manicured, something that's easy for the volunteers to be able to access and uh, take care of the weeds in as far as plant ID goes. As far as water-wise, we are able to turn off valves on each and every bed depending on what the plants in that bed need. And the third part of the garden is what we have as controlled chaos, where we have different groupings of plants. We still have a very English style garden where everything is packed in really tight, which is great for the weed pressure. We have so much of the things that we want that there isn't very much opportunity for all of the things that we don't want to grow. In this space, all of the different plants that we've put in here are in groupings of anywhere from five to nine plants of the same kind in one mass. This is easy for volunteers to be able to identify the different plants uh, from the weeds and it makes them really pop. If you think of a patch quilt, instead of having a bunch of small little spots of color, we have large patches of color that really stand out. This part of the garden is unique in the way that it collects all of the rainwater coming off of the greenhouse and it is using the plants. There's a swale in the bottom that can fill up up to a foot deep as it filters down into the soil. This project on the south side of the Evergreen House was made possible through a WaterWise Landscapes program through the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum that was funded by the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy with funds from the EPA. We're really excited to have a garden that showcases these three different garden design styles and how to be WaterWise in your landscape. Thanks to Amy and Chrissy for those great features. And of course, we'll hear more from that gang out west next week on Backyard Farmer. All right, we have two announcements tonight. The first one is East Campus Discovery Days, which is this Saturday. This is the very last one, 10 to two on East Campus. A lot of fun for everybody. And then we have our Grow a Row program, which is the Backyard Farmer Produce donations uh, is, are kicking up again Tuesdays from 4.30 to 7 in the Backyard Farmer Garden, and we donate that produce. All right, Jody, uh, ID Central. The first one is alien life form from Carney. She saw these small pods. What are those? These are the eggs of green lace wings. Those are awesome. Okay. <laughs> Second one comes to us from Lincoln. She's wondering what this insect is inside the house on the patio door, and when she hit it, it stung her. Yeah, this is a spider wasp. Use a fly swatter next time <laughs> so you don't get hurt. Uh, your third one comes to us from Omaha. Uh, they came across this interesting <coughs> insect. He thinks this is a female Dyson fly. He's never seen one before. Close. It's a female Dobson fly. Dobson. All right. So not Dyson the vacuum cleaner. No, but so it's a good guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good guy. Okay. One more, and this is Grand Island, and she says these are all over the oak and wondering if they will damage the tree. These are green June beetles, and they will not damage the tree. All right, nice job. Rock, your first one comes to us from Omaha. What is this weed called, and how do you control it near other plants? 
Uh, this is Japanese hops. It's very invasive. It's a perennial. Uh, you can spot spray, but you ought to pull it up, and you need to rogue this one out because it'll, and it doesn't taste good in beer. It makes beer taste bitter. So all of the above, get rid of this plant and spot spray or otherwise, but it's going to be hard to get rid of. All right. Uh, your second one, it comes to us from two or three, which is Creeping Charlie. How to control it? Is it too too hot now? Yeah, it's too hot now. Uh, it's better controlled in the fall because it is a perennial products containing triclopure, two to three applications as soon as it cools off in September. All right, uh, and your third one is what type of plant is this? Is it a weed or is it a flower? And how do you <clears throat> control this one? It's one of the nightshades and it's it's a weed in this case. I mean, a lot of our desirable vegetables are also nightshades like potato and whatever, but this one needs to be taken out. I think it's common nightshade, but without a flower or seed head on it, it's really hard to key up totally. All right. So get rid of it. And how do you do that? Oh, uh, spot spray with you know, to with a broadly control product. Or dig it. Or dig it. Okay. That's a better suggestion. How about we dig it? How about we dig it? <laughs> Sounds like a song. Okay, Lauren, uh, your first one comes to us actually from Indianapolis. Uh, a lilac in Indianapolis mm -hmm. looking like this. I know Kyle talked about diseases last week. I think we have one more picture on this one. And I think with this, this could be many things, but it's something related to those main uh, branches. If you follow them down, if there's a canker, it could be boars. All right, so cut them out. I would try cutting out the dead branches if, if it continues like that and just see if you see any evidence of, of boars or if it's a canker, just prune it out three inches below the affected area. All right, or go to your local extension office in Indiana. Take a sample. Huh? All right, uh, you have another one. This comes to us from Westfield, she Iowa. She just wonders, what kind of shroom is this? Is it edible, of course? Well, it, there's not a picture of the underside, but just the way it looks, I think it's some sort of a Pleurotus species. So uh, look at the underside and then look up some pictures of Pleurotus and see if you find a match. And should she eat it? No. <laughs> okay, and then you have two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is a weird looking fungus in the petunia bed, only in the commercial garden soil that was poured into the barrel. They're in northern Harrison County, Iowa. The flower bed is mostly in full sun. They wonder, is this a harmful or will it harm the petunias? And, and, you know, at first look, I thought this was a slime mold, but I don't believe it's a slime mold. It, in another picture, you could see it's more of a filamentous fungal growth that's, that's covering. Um, it's some sort of saprophyte that's breaking down the material. Uh, and the biggest thing is would be to try to break it up because it will form a hydrophobic layer where water will not get to the plants. So you could just you could pick it up and pull it out uh, or break it up. All right, and I think you have maybe have one more picture <coughs> to pull up of yeah, that's the kind same. of the same thing. Yeah. And we so it's it's more of a strange. mat. That's why I didn't say it was a slime mold. Yeah, but okay. it's not common to All see right. that. All right, Sarah, um, we have a little over two minutes left. The first uh, question here is: This is cone flower. A few years ago, this particular plant did the, sort of the tubular rays. Think. They think it's healthy. They wonder why this happened. Have you ever seen it before? Or is, is it okay? There are some cultivars of coneflower that have petals that are shaped like this. So there are genetics within the coneflower that, that develops this. So this is an, a normal type of a thing. There's a cultivar, I think it's called Quills and Thrills, which has <laughs> petals that are shaped just exactly like this. So keep it. It's kind of a fun, unusual coneflower. It is, all right. And then you have an Omaha viewer who has a hydrangea that is kind of doing some strange things with some of the flowers. Do we have any idea what's going on on this? So if you look at the flower in the back that has the, the greenish, whitish uh, petal, those are actually bracts, which is a modified leaf. And I think that the, the flowers in the foreground they just haven't developed those bracts. Um, so these, what you have there is a cluster of just all fertile flowers, which are not showy. Um, so if you don't like that, I mean, you could just prune those plants out and just try to get rid of them so that you don't get more and more of this developing. All right, and one more, Sarah, this comes to us from North Platte. She wants to know what is the name of these flowers and anything quickly we can tell her about them. Yeah, this is a, an ornamental onion, an allium called millennium. This is a very, very popular cultivar of this particular type of plant. So great addition to a garden. And I believe they are so far sterile. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we don't have seedlings of this one as opposed to some of the white flowering ones that right. <laughs> are everywhere in everybody's garden. Right. Like uh, we had geisha, I think, which was one of the All-America selections, which mm -hmm. was white and mm -hmm. 
and yeah, they we, do really well in hot, dry locations. So right. you've got a, you know, a, a hell strip near the street, or you've got a just someplace really, really hot and dry. They would do great there. Absolutely, and nothing eats them. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is also a uh, kind of a perfect thing if you're a plant in the plant world and you have wascally wabbits or deer. Or and they start to bloom this time of year. So again, they bring that pop of color to what can be kind of the tired mid to late summer garden so they can make things look pretty. Excellent. Thank you very much.